first time a plaza exploded be even before the choir was finished. Uh, shall we give thanks to God one more time? The first two days of our special dawn services to begin the year, uh, I believe that we were all greatly blessed, and I believe that God has blessed this year for us through the messages. And uh, first, we had four days, but first two days, we received a message with the title, Adam, where are you? And may our answer be what the choir is saying, here am I, Lord. And may God say, I will keep you in my heart all year long and all your life. Amen? And I believe that uh, that is the answer. Uh, the, 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 what the choir is saying today uh, is the answer uh, to that question. And also the uh, answer to the sermon today. I will be sharing uh, from, that from those messages with the title, Where Was Adam? Where was Adam? It was when God said, Adam, where are you? It was the first call of redemption and first call of, call of love and call for repentance. We are the Adams that need to respond to God's calling. And I believe that God is asking each and every one of us today, where are you? Where are you today? And we might say, duh, where I'm at church. But let us think spiritually. Where are you situated? In what spiritual place are you standing today? And I believe that God is asking each and every one of us today. And he's asking us to think about where we are right now. Where am I supposed to be? And we need to ask the question, Am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I where God wants me to be? Am, I be? am I able to say, God, wherever you want me to go, send me. Here I am, Lord. So today, let us think about where Adam was, where the Garden of Eden was, what the Garden of Eden signifies, and where he ended up to be. And as we think about that, let us ask, let us really think about where I am, where you are today. And I have based this study and sermon on the founding pastor, Reverend Abraham Park's sermons and uh, the contents of his books, and also uh, other biblical scholars' works, uh, mainly Dr. John Walton, Gregory Beale, and Gordon Benham. Uh, the Bible was written, I, I think I mentioned this last week too, the Bible was written for us, for our salvation and atonement, and for our redemption. It is given to the Israelites when they were in the wilderness, while, uh, when, after they were saved or, or taken out of Egypt from the slavery. So these people were slaves in Egypt, Right? And they were taken out of, into the wilderness, and they're wondering, what are we doing here? Where is our goal? Who are we? Who is this God? Because they used to serve many gods in Egypt. Which God is this that's leading us, supposedly, without an image? You know, in Egypt, every god had some kind of image or where they can, can come to. But this God has... No image, no source. He's just speaking through Moses and Aaron, giving instru instructions to where they should go. And to them, God gave this Genesis, the five, first five books, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the law, through Moses. So we need to ask, we need to think about why God gave this Bible to his people. And we have to understand that this Bible was given to the ancient Israelites who just came out of ancient Egypt, who were influenced by the ancient Mesopotamian culture in their language. Okay? When we learn a language, we learn their culture. 
language contains culture. And therefore, when we are trying to translate from one language to another, we need to learn the translator or interpreter needs to learn to deliver that in the same impact according to the target culture. So it needs to translate the culture from one to the other. Language assumes culture, operates in a culture, serves a culture, and is designed to communicate to, into a framework of culture. For example, let's think about one word, beauty. The word beauty can be translated and interpreted and understood in many different ways, depending on culture, depending on which time period you're living in, depending on who you are your background, what you think is beautiful. True? So how many people are sitting here? 50 people? We probably have 50 different versions of what beauty means. It's be, be, even though we are all from the same time period right now, probably similar background because we're living in the same country here. But even then, everybody has slightly different definition and understanding of what the word beauty is and means, right? Likewise, in the Bible, everything written there is designed to, for that culture during that time period. And therefore, it, is, it would be difficult and it would be erroneous for us to try to apply exactly to what, what it says face value to our culture, our education, our background, our technology. Are you still awake? So we're going to go into uh, some astronomical discussions, philosophical discussions. Uh, so I pray that you can stay awake. I hope you had some coffee this morning. Okay. First. In order for us to understand where Adam was, we need to think about this first point. What are the cultural ideas behind Genesis chapter 1? Okay. Meaning, we need to look at it from two different perspectives, at least. Why did God give Genesis chapter 1 account to the Israelites in the wilderness? And what, how did the Israelites understand it? How did they view it? Okay. Was God trying to give them an upgrade on their understanding of science and cosmology, beginning the, the, the study of origin? Was God trying to teach them and educate them about how the, the, the astronomical order, the, how, where the sun is, what the, sun, uh, the Earth's relationship with the sun is, the orbits? The galaxy, the universe, is that what God is trying to do? Is, is God trying to rather speak about history? How long the earth has been around, when the creation was, all that. Whether there were dinosaurs or not. See, their understanding of cosmos, they did not know that stars were suns. Did you know that stars are suns? No? See, maybe you're not so different from their, them. Stars are like suns, right? The, it, turn it around. The sun is one of, our sun is one of the stars. The earth is not a star. It's just a planet that's orbiting around the sun, right? They didn't know that the sun was much farther away than the moon. They didn't know that the earth was round going around the sun. They did not know that the moon was any farther away from the birds flying in the sky. Their concept of the sky is not a vaporous atmosphere, but they thought it was a hard thing covering it. Okay? Bronze plate type of thing. They thought the expanse was that sky that they see, but it's hard. Hard enough to uphold the residences of the gods above the atmosphere. 
hard enough to withhold the waters above from falling in. That was their concept of the sky. And so was God trying to re-educate them and update their understanding of what the sky was, what the earth is like in Genesis chapter 1? I don't think so, because the, the accounts of the sixth day creation in Genesis chapter 1 does not follow the, the understanding of astronomy and cosmology that we understand. Some Christians, however, approach this text and try to apply it to modern-day science understanding, and that causes problems. Problem with this approach, that it doesn't only fit, but it may give a wrong perspective, wrong purpose in reading the Bible, and wrong understanding of God's intention in giving us the Bible. So that's their the idea behind Genesis chapter 1. So what is the answer? Why did God give us the Bible? I think, I think, I think we should, well, we all understand already from the studies of our, uh, our Bible studies and sermons and history of redemption series. The reason for God giving his people and us the, the Bible is for his redemptive will and soteriological purpose, salvation, purpose of salvation. To the Israelites who are wandering in the wilderness, wondering who this God is, God is introducing himself to them through Genesis chapter 1 and all the way. God is introducing to them why they need to walk in the wilderness, why they needed to come out of Egypt, where they are going, what kind of purpose they have as people of God. That's what they need to understand. That's what we need to understand by reading Genesis chapter 1. Okay. So second point, what does it mean for something to exist then? What does it mean to, for something to exist? We can think about the existence of God, existence of God's creation, and existence of Adam in the Garden of Eden. Okay? In order for us to understand where Adam was, we need to understand their, the, the right concept of existence. It may sound a bit philosophical this time, but we need to think about this. So, for example, what is this? This is a cup. Does this exist? Yes, yes I feel like a science teacher. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you know? Why do you say yes? You see. Do you hear it? Yes. When I do this, my finger hurts. This makes a sound. So it must be solid, right? You feel it, and you believe that I touched it. So feel, see, touch. And then, what color is this? Do you all agree this is white? To me, this is blue. See, now, if I disagree, I say this is blue, you're now wondering the, the very existence of this cup. Is this my, what I perceive? Is that the right thing? But then if I say, yes, I agree, it is blue, uh, this, not blue, white, then you, you will not have any doubts. Okay? We agree. We can be pretty sure. Now, what did I just do? Uh, I just proves that we base our concept of existence on material, our senses. It has to be proved by our sen uh, five senses at least, or at least two of our senses for it to exist. So for us to believe that the sun exists up there in the sky, how do, how do we know? We have, we have the technology right now. We have the pictures and photos, the, the Hubble telescope. And I heard recently uh, they invented or created a telescope that is much more powerful than Hubble telescope, and so on. It has to prove, it has to be proven through senses, all based on material. However, in the ancient world, it's not always 
the, the material proof that proves the existence. Let us think about another example, an example of a business. Uh, how do you prove uh, the, the existence of a business, a corporation? You have to check the ROS, ROC, uh, you know, see if they filed and registered under the government, right? They went through the paperwork. What, what else? It, does that mean the business exists? Depends, depends. You go, you, so you find the address, you go there, right? It has the signboard. But you're trying to buy noodles there, it's a noodle, noodle shop, right? But no noodles. No owner. It's not operating. So what do you say? From the cu customer's perspective, that business exists or not? It's, it's not happening. How do we define the existence of the business depending on their activity? The physical presence, is, presence might be there. The physical filing might be there. But in order to create a business, you have to go through the, you're, you're not necessarily uh, you know, making, you know, you're not baking a, a, a porcelain uh, or clay, you're not making a material thing, it's more of a process. It's, you define it through its function and what it produces, okay? Kind of like a system. When you create, when you make a system, you're not making a material thing, you're, make, you're putting things in order. And so many uh, scholars believe that the creation story, okay, please do not mistake me, I say it from the beginning, we are not, we are not ruling out or denying the fact that God created the material world also, the whole universe. You believe that, right? God created everything. However, the reason, uh, we're talking about the purpose of this account of the Bible. Is it really to tell us the details and the journal of what God created physically? Or is there a different purpose in giving us this Bible? Right? And so looking through the order of creation, before we get to the order of creation, uh, existence. So you understand what that existence is. The existence of God's order, the system. God's, when God said God created and he said it is good, what does that mean? It looks good, it's, I made it well, or it's in the order that he wanted to see. We can talk about ontological perspective, epistemological. Do you understand ontology, epistemology? I think I shared this before, but you know, I, I don't blame you for not remembering because it's, it's, is that English? <laughs> ontology is about being, the actual existence. Epistemology is what we perceive, what we understand, how we understand. How do you understand that this cup actually exists? This is your perspective, right? I, I won't go into the details. But, but, for the Israelites in the wilderness, was God trying to prove material creation, material origin of things? Or what is the message that God was trying to give to them. God wrote these accounts. If they are not to prove science or speak only about the material existence, if they are not to tell us the account of the beginning of things materially, and if it's not merely to tell us when and how the material creation took place, is there more that God intended to tell us through these accounts? In the ancient world, what was most crucial and significant to their understanding of existence was the way that different parts of the cosmos functioned. In the ancient world, they believed there was a God behind everything. 
God behind the sun, God behind the stars, God, behind, God that controlled the rivers, God get, that, that produced the crops. So their interest was, what God is behind all this? Which God? That's the mindset of the Egyptians and Mesopotamians. So the Israelites who came out, to them, God is saying, there's only one God who is behind all of that. Who is that? Yahweh. And that God is leading you right now. And that God wants to be your king in the new place. How can we know this? We, there's ancient Near Eastern texts and also the Bible. We, I won't go uh, spend too much time in trying to prove that, hoping and believing that you understand it. So we will go to the next point, third point. What's their understanding of creation? What does it mean to create? God created, God planted the garden, God created the whole universe, and then God put, created Adam and put him in the Garden of Eden. That's where he was. And that's the answer, right? But the word to create in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, is bara, bara creation. We know it as ex nihilo creation, meaning created from nothing. It was nothing and created, right? But what does it exactly mean in this context? If existence is de defined by material terms, creating must be a material, material creation of material forms. Is this too difficult? Okay. If existence is only by material, defined by material, then creation must be making this material thing. If existence is defined by function, creation is a function-giving activity. If existence is defined by redemption, then Creation is a redemptive activity. So our, that's why we talked about the, the, the definition of existence, because according to the, our understanding of existence, our understanding of creation will change. So evidence from the Old Testament as well as the ancient Near Eastern texts suggest that creation account is not just a material creation. We believe that God and God did create everything, the whole universe. But the account is not, not comprehensively talking about everything that God created. Look at Genesis chapter 1. It doesn't, the six days of creation doesn't include so many things. Do you agree? It's not in the logical order either, right? On the first day, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, God created light, light, right? But then on the fourth day, God created the sun. So where did the light on the first day come from? Did God create electricity first? I don't think so, right? So it's, and then later through John, God says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was the light of mankind. It's not talking about sunlight, natural light, moonlight, or electric light. So it gives a new definition to what light is, right? And if you can turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, what does it say? Genesis, see, the, the first day of creation began in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. That's the first thing God created according to this account. God said, let there be light before anything was there. But then Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, right before that, what does God say? What does the Bible say? The earth was formless. So before the first day of creation... The, world, the earth existed? Is it? See, the order is, is non-logical to us if we are looking at it as a material creation account. 
The earth was formless, void, and dark, right? Of course, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, does that mean God created the heavens and the earth and then created the sun much later? Even that doesn't make sense, right? I think I'm digging deeper, deeper into my own problem <laughs> and trouble here. So, so the purpose of redemptive historical and soteriological purpose of the Bible, it tells us of the order, function, and the spiritual state that God considered is, was good. That is the account of Genesis chapter 1. The order, the state, the function of all beings and the spiritual state that God considered was good. And therefore, it shows us the original image and the state to which we, you and I, have to return to, be redeemed to through the work of salvation and redemption. So it's showing us where we should be. And that place is called the Garden of Eden. That was, up to this far, was the introduction. <laughs> so we understand what Garden of Eden was. Okay? Now, fourth, let us think about the Garden of Eden. This is where Adam was. It's what, what do you think about when you hear the word garden? I think about my, I think about my mom's backyard with a, a few rows of furrows with, you know, cherry tomatoes, cucumber, you know. Is that what you think about, garden? See, this garden is not just a Mesopotamian farmland that God is talking about, where God put Adam to do little sowing and harvesting. But it is an archetypal sanctuary. It's a sanctuary. It's, it's a, all, every, every language, every, every description of the Garden of Eden is, about, is telling us that this is a temple. It's a, it's a sanctuary. It's a, it's a tabernacle. It's a place where God dwells and also man dwells with the purpose of worshiping God. So let us think about a few aspects of this garden. First, just as the temple was the place of God's unique presence experienced by priests in the Old Testament, so Eden was the place where God walked with Adam. Adam and Eve sensed the presence, not only sensed, saw and experienced the presence of God. And Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says, God was walking in the garden. That word walk is halak in hippal form. Okay? It means walking back and forth. He was continuing to walk there. And, I, and, and we know that that word is used when it says, Enoch walked with God. Right? It's not just one time, you know, jalan jalan, you know, striding down the street. It's, it's, it's a form of life. It's speaking about the way of life. He was walking with God. He made it that he is always with God every day of his life. Right? So God's presence is there. God lives there. That's what it means. And this word is used... In the Old Testament, when it speaks about God's presence in the temple, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 12, Deuteronomy 23, verse 14, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. When it says God's, it speaks about God's presence there, it uses the word he was walking there. Where? In the tabernacle and in the temple. Second, Adam is depic depicted as a priest res with respect to the task that was given to him. And we, I shared this 
uh, several times the words that we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. God put him in the garden to do two things. In English, my version, it says to cultivate and to keep. It means to work and to keep and guard. Abad and shamar. And especially when these two words are used together, sometimes they are not used together and mean the same way, but when, especially when they're used together in the Old Testament, it's mostly in regards to what the priests are supposed to do in the temple and the tabernacle. For reference, Numbers chapter 3, verse 30, uh, verses 7 and 8. Numbers chapter 8, verses 25 and 26. Numbers chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. First Chronicles 23, verse 32. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 14. As also as reference, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. It speaks about how Adam was like a priest donned with the priestly garment. So what the priests were doing in the temple and the tabernacle, they call it, they were serving the Lord. That word serve is abad. And they were to keep, make sure to maintain everything in the temple is well preserved and, and in the place where God wants them to be, in a state where God wants to see them. And that's to shamar. And that's a task that is, that is given to us, to serve him and to make sure everything is in order, spiritually and physically. Third, there were cherubim, or cherubim, put in the garden to guard the tree of life. In the temple, you see that the embroidery of, in the design of the cherubim on the veil, and also cherubim, two cherubim facing each other on top of the Ark of the Covenant. In the deepest, in the center, in the most important place. Exodus chapter 25, verses 18 through 22. Israel's tabernacle and temple, and even in Ezekiel's temple, we see wood carvings, we see the lampstand in the form, in the shape of almond tree. We see Aaron's budded rod like a tree. And we see designs of palm trees. All these gave it a, a garden-like ambiance in the temple. The temple was the garden. It was a depiction of the original garden. First Kings chapter 6, verse 18 Verse 29, verse 32, verse 35, 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 18 and 20. And then Ezekiel refers to Eden as the garden of God. And then he says it's the holy mountain of God and also alludes it as it contains sanctuaries. So Ezekiel says the garden of Eden was a holy mountain of God where was Ezekiel's temple? On the holy mountain of God. Right? And it says it had sanctuaries inside. Right? Just as the entrance to the temple and the tabernacle were on the east side, we see in Genesis 3, verse 24, the entrance to the Garden of Eden was also in the east side. Seventh, as a river flowed out from the Garden of Eden, so a river flows from Ezekiel's temple, and also the New Jerusalem. The three parts of the temple, same thing. And lastly, just as the climax and purpose of creation was rest. The six days of creation and the seventh day, when God finished the creation, he rested. So the final purpose and result of creating the garden temple was rest. The main purpose and ultimate goal and purpose of the temple was Sabbath offering, Sabbath rest. Okay. 
And so both the Garden of Eden and the temple, the purpose is rest. There are two Hebrew words that, that mean rest. First is Shabbat, which we pronounce it as Sabbath. Right? Second is Noach, which we pronounce as Noah. Okay? According to the Jewish understanding, Shabbat is transition, like a vehicle, means. Okay? The final goal is Noach. It's the purpose. And so God tells the Israelites when they were fighting the Canaanites to conquer the land, when they were fighting against the, the enemies, God promises them, I will give you rest from your enemies. Which word do you think God uses to say that? I will give you rest from your enemies. Shabbat or Noach? He says, I'll give you Noach from the enemies. That doesn't mean, okay, you will defeat the enemies and you will have a nap, you'll have a good sleep, you can go on staycation, you can have a holiday. That doesn't mean that. Noach means the enemy, the invaders are defeated by God, right? Through the process of Shabbat, Noach is given. Okay? And that state of Noach is the enjoyment of God's peace, shalom. And the word shalom can be translated and, and defined as the Lord has broken and destroyed all the enemies. So it's a state of the Lord, God, sitting on his throne, ruling over his realm, his dominion, without any enemy's invasion. That's what is called rest. And that's what Lamech was praying for when he was naming his son Noah. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 10, God says, I will give you rest from your enemies. Joshua chapter 1, verses 13, and, uh, verse 13, and Joshua chapter 21, verse 44, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 4. He's saying, he's referring to achieving a state of order according to God's will. And such rest is the goal for all of us. That's, what, that's the kind of rest that we are seeking for. And that rest means God will make that place his residence. And he will set up his throne there, and he will sit on that throne, and it will be under his reign. Psalm 132, verses 7 and 8, it says the temple is, it identifies the temple both as God's dwelling place and as his resting place. Psalm 132, verse 14, goes on to identify this resting place as the place where he sits enthroned. So God's dwelling place, God's resting place, and God's throne. Still awake? Understand? And then after Ezekiel gives the temple account, the description of the temple, in the midst of that description of the temple from chapter 40 to 48, he says in chapter 43, verse 7, it says, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. It's his dwelling place. It's his throne. It's his resting place, the temple. I sincerely pray that Zion Church will become that place of Noah, that your homes will be the place where God will rest God will be enthroned, and God will make a dwelling. Then what was Adam's task? God said to Adam, multiply and subdue. Rule over. What does that mean? Expand the boundaries that fall under God's reign as God sits on the throne. That's, that was the work of Adam. He was supposed to subdue them, 
But what happened? He got subdued. He was supposed to expand God's kingdom, but now, after the fall, he was expanding the realm of sinfulness. And there, God is asking Adam, Adam, where are you? What are you doing? Which, which borders, which boundaries are you, do you belong to? So as the last point, let us think about Adam's place after the fall. Where was Adam after rejecting God's word? Adam's address had changed. His address was the Garden of Eden. His address had changed. Are you ready to write down the new address? Adam's address. He had two addresses. I'll give you one. Okay. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 27. I'll read it quickly for you. Although uh, we have read it several times already last year. I'll read it for you. Let us really think about what happened and how he moved. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they, gave, they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible men and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They changed their image. They changed their identity. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned, their, burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. What is the result? Result? Unnatural things. Result? Disobedience, idolatry, and adultery. Second address, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. For I am afraid... That perhaps when I come, I may find you to be not what I wish, and may be found by you to be not what you wish. That perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. And later it says, and not repented of the impurity, immorality, sensuality which they have practiced. Raise your hand if you don't have any of these. Can you raise your hand if you don't have half of these? <laughs> this is our current address. This is where we are. Are you proud of it? Are we able to say, here am I, Lord, when the Lord says, where are you? We are given the titles of elders, pastor, eldress, deacon. Apart from all that title, we are children of God, Christians, believers of God, who say that we have dedicated our life to God. If you can allow me to ask you to do this, I'll give you ten sec five seconds. To think about it, it won't take very long for you to, uh, hopefully, uh, maybe, it won't take very long. Take five seconds to think about the last time you did any of these. The last time you grumbled or complained or criticized. Done? Done? When is the last time? Last year? Before your 2022 began, right? Or is it this morning? Yesterday? When's the last time we committed sin? When's the last time we gossiped? When do we gossip? How do we gossip? 
We don't say, I'm gossiping, okay, ready, set, go. We say, I'm very concerned about this person. I'm very concerned about this church. I'm very concerned about this country and what they're doing. And because we are concerned, we not, not only tell one person, we tell everybody we meet because we're very concerned. And it concerns them, the listeners. And those will be concerned, and they will, cons- they will be concerned about this one person or this one group. And so they will go and tell all those that they love about their concern. And what does that become? That's called gossip. It begins from my concern. But mixed in with, under the title concern, I'm concerned, I care for that person. What is put in? This is the ingredients. Right? Strife, jealousy, anger, angry temper, dispute, standard, arrogance, disturbances. I'm concerned be- because I'm better than him. At least I'm not doing that. Let us not let those concerns put us down the spiral of this sin. When's the last time we, com- we were not in the right place? You know, when, you, when, we, when I was making that complaint or grumbling state and remark about somebody, about country, about church, where was I? Where were you when you were saying that? Were you, was I in a place of a pastor? Was I in a place of a son of God, a Christian? Or was I in the wrong place spiritually? Where are you? Where were you? I'm going to end, although uh, a bit late. I'm going to end with a testimony that I heard yesterday. But let us really think about where we are today. Where are we? And that is defined by what we say and what we do. How we perceive things. Where are you, Adam? Adam? God is not just wondering and questioning. It's not because he doesn't know. He's telling us, wake up. Realize where you need to be. When you are at a different place during worship service, you need to, we need to learn to ask ourselves, where am I? What am I doing? Where am I supposed to be? The testimony... A young doctor, medical doctor. Uh, he has little children, married, and he became a, a surgeon in Seoul National University Hospital. It's kind of like NUH here, right? The best, pretty much the best uh, hospital in Korea. He was a surgeon. His major was. Uh, liver transplant. But during his residency and studies, he received grace and received Christ into his heart and dedicated his life to him. It was not so easy because, you know, the surgeon, not all the surgeons are uh, Christians and their, their private lives are not so, you know, pure. So he says. But he believed that God wanted him to go into that department. And later, as he was praying and worshiping, he felt like the Lord was speaking to him into his heart that he needs to become a missionary, a medical missionary. And he was wondering, maybe, maybe it's just my thinking. But then his wife came to him and said, in my prayer, I felt this... I felt like God is leading us to become, become missionaries. So they started to pray several months. God, if you want us to become missionaries, t- tell us where we should go. And then they found an opening to Ethiopia. So they went over to Ethiopia, realized that not enough electricity Electricity gets cut without warning during the day for unplanned or un, un, you know, uncertain amount of time. And then water is cut once in a while. And that, you know, medical doctor, the best hospital in Korea, 
He was, he could have had, uh, he had his future laid out for him. He could have lived a very comfortable life, luxurious life if he wanted to, and he could have done God's work there. But somehow, God led him to Ethiopia, where he's not getting paid, right? He's doing missions work, and he catches malaria, severe case of malaria, almost dies, but he survives. And after a couple of years, he's diagnosed with something else called Parkinson's disease. He, he said he felt like the sky was crumbling down on him. He and his wife cried many days. His parents and his other relatives were asking them, why? What are you doing there? Why did you go there? That's not your place. Your place is here back in Korea. What are you doing? You got sick probably because you, you went over there. So he also asked God many times, why? Why is this happening to me? God, wasn't I trying to serve you? I gave up everything and went to Ethiopia. Go through all that suffering. My, I put my kids, I could have put my kids in the best school in Korea. But now they, they're not getting good education. But even then we went there. And God, what is this? Did I do something wrong? Am I in the wrong place? So he, he spent months crying out to God, crying and praying. And one day, he went to a park just during the day. He was praying to God. And a shower of rain started to come. And he wanted to try, try to come back home, but he couldn't. And he found a huge tree, and he went under and found shelter. And there he was praying again in tears, and then, and, and then he felt like the Lord was saying, you don't have to go home just because there is a shower. A shower of rain, the rain will pass. And then he realized, it's not just this, about this rain. This suffering will pass. Just because there's suffering, because I'm, just because I'm going through the sickness doesn't mean I need to go back to Korea. But then he said, but Lord, this vessel is broken. Because of Parkinson's disease, I cannot do surgery anymore. I cannot function with my abilities anymore. This vessel is broken. I cannot carry anything for you. I cannot do anything for you. This is not my place. And then he received the answer another day. When he was at church, somebody was giving uh, offering praise. And that person who was giving the offering praise said one thing before she started singing. She said, our offering is like the two small coins that a widow gave. It's not what we can give. It's the fact that we are giving ourselves to the Lord. And there he was just crying in the service. And he, he, he was reminded in his heart almost felt like the Lord saying, you're broken, and that's why I died for you. It's not about what you, what you can contain in your vessel. It's the fact that you gave yourself to me. I already received you, and I can still use you. From that point on, he found peace in his heart. He says, even before he got sick, he never had that kind of peace. He found peace because he was confirmed. He knew, this is where I need to be. God is asking us, where are you? It doesn't mean in a luxury place, in a place where you're never sick. Even if there's difficulties and hardships, when we realize here, right here, is the place where the Lord wants me to be, that's when we find peace. When we find ourselves under the throne of the Lord, that's when we find Noah, true rest. So I pray we don't know what will come our way in year 2022. 
But I pray that we will, find, we will be able to find ourselves under the throne of God. Amen. That we will spiritually and physically be where he wants us to be. Amen. When the Lord says, Sam, where are you? Adam, where are you? May we be able to say, Lord, here I am. You told me to be here. I kept, I stayed here. May we be able to say that. And may the Lord give us peace and that eternal rest. Eternal rest doesn't mean you die and go to heaven. That eternal rest and eternal life we can enjoy here on this earth as long as we are within that boundary. And may Zion Church fulfill that task to multiply and subdue. Multiply the reign, the, the, the boundaries of God's reign, not only in Singapore, but throughout the world. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, the only thing we want is to be where you want us to be. We believe that you will give everyone, our Zion Church members and their families, true peace and true Noah, Sabbath and rest. And Father, we, everyone is going through different kinds of difficulties and hardships. But even then, help us to be where you put us. When you say, where are you, Adam? May we be able to say, Lord, here I am. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give thanks to God. Amen.